everyone. Thank you for watching. Um, today I want to do a video that's a little bit different. Um, I read this book, Don Melton, A Hero for Our Time by David Hawks, and it's a little different from the normal political um, video because Melton wasn't just a philosopher or um, interested in political theory is a poet and a, and a political figure both. Um, and he's, he, that makes him a, a really interesting person in history. And um, the biography was interesting. It's by a Marxist. So it's a little bit biased. And I'm, I was concerned that some of, some of the things that he says he attributes ideas he attributes to Milton are not actually accurate, that they're actually his, his ideas, and he's kind of imposing some collectivism back onto Milton. But um, I think for the most part, it does a good job of gleaning um, political and ideological themes out of Milton's work, which can be a tough task because he he's a genius. He is like Shakespeare, an amazing writer, amazing poet. But um, for us who are not accustomed to, um, to that kind of vocabulary and syntax, it can be difficult to figure out exactly what he's getting at in, in, some, of, in some of his writings, especially Paradise Lost. Um, but, I mean, they're all considered to be great literature. He's um, one of the best English writers of all time. So I think there are definitely things that we can learn from him. Uh, not just about literature, but about um, kind of philosophy, philosophy of life as well. Um, just a little bit of background, Mel John Milton wrote in the 1600s, he was, um, he served England under Oliver Cromwell, who was involved in politics, and um, wrote poetry and um, political essays and different things like that. Um, one of his most, well, there's a couple, because some of his works kind of stand out um, in history. You have Paradise Lost, obviously, which everyone has to read. Um, and then he has two essays. I have kind of made it through the generations, a little 300 years plus um, since he wrote. And they are Iconoclastes which is a treatise defending the killing of King Charles I, again, and um, kind of a point-by-point -point ref refutation of the canon of Icon Basilique, which, is, um, which was a popular pamphlet that was attributed to Charles I, published posthumously, um, and claimed that he was an innocent martyr, whereas Milton's Reputation um, defends the people for their actions and claims that he was a tyrant and um, criticizes the monarchy in general. So that was um, that one's really interesting. It's it's kind of less applicable to today, I think, because it does focus on the monarchy. Um, and Milton had an idea that he he attributed People, somebody's ideas and to to their to their personality, he kind of assumed that who you are and what you say are inextricably, inextricably entwined, and um, so so he tended to um, criticize not just the ideas but the actual you know the actions of people, um, which it you know makes it less valuable for us, but. Um, he also wrote another essay, Areopagitica, which is, you know, possibly his most famous essay, and that is a um, a request for the um, Congress in England to rescind their recent law that um, um, requiring licenses for publishers, publishing of whatever pamphlets and stuff. And that's, um, that was really cool. I really, I really liked that essay. So, um, I think 
Dan Milton's ideas are very interesting, and I think they're not um, not just a historical curiosity, but also applicable to um, modern libertarianism, because I think that we follow in in kind of the heritage of John Milton as a political revolutionary fighting for freedom. So we'll see. Um, he, uh, the, you know, the book's called A Hero for Our Time, and that's largely because Milton claims to be writing for future generations. He thought that, that the people in, in his own day were so tied to their philosophy that it was going to be impossible for them to change. So he focused on writing for the future, for future generations who might be able to remove the shackles of his his current society. Um, he has a couple of really fundamental um, themes that kind of go throughout his work. The first one is the idea of mental slavery. And um, this is interesting because he was a Puritan. The heritage of Puritans is the um, the, is the Reformation, and um, during the Reform left with the Reformation, the literal you know iconoclasts, the image breakers, would go around and they would remove all of the statues of the saints inside of the churches and um, outside on the facades. They would um, literally tear them down and 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 break the images. But um, John Milton took that kind of more on a metaphysical level, um, a, a philosophical um, breaking of images to free, um, to free society, to free people's minds from this, this mental slavery that's kind of um, perpetuated and, and not challenged. Um, there's a couple aspects that he talks about with mental slavery. Um, one of the things is that people are unwilling to search for the truth on their own. They're, they're very ready to accept um, the authority of, of people who, who just kind of tell them what to believe without actually judging it, without weighing, um, weighing the truth. And um, he saw that as a really bad thing. And the other, the other part of it is, is Milton's kind of definition of images, what images are. And um, I think idolatry is the is kind of the best example, not so much the um, the archaic idol worship of the ancient times, but more um, more close to 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 Milton to Milton's day, um, the kind of the perversion of Catholicism. That, um, that Milton saw in in the church, which was people who you know would wear medallions or, or carry relics, and they thought that that having the physical thing um, protected them, instead of recognizing that the, the the symbol is a sign of their commitment to God, and that um, that their their faith is that God would protect them, not in the, in the physical thing. Um, so I think that's a good example of, of what Milton feared, um, that people would replace the images, uh, or would, would replace um, the truth with, with these images that were, that were kind of copies of the truth, but they were also distortions because they left out, they left out the real meaning and the significance of, of what the truth was, and they only carried the, the external trappings. So, um, so that's really fundamental to Milton, and he also um, just did, did a really great job illustrating his what he saw as the solution to, to the problem, and I think this is where um, I can really relate to to what Milton was talking about. Um, the first thing, the first thing that Milton um, focused on was was the image breaking, and I think that that's a really good illustration. It's still an image because um, Milton didn't really see th images as something that you could avoid. 
because it's, it's kind of like the proverbial um, rose colored glasses the um you you have a, you have a, a certain perspective you have a bias you have a world view and um it's unavoidable um you, you you can't true objectivity is not possible so what you have to do is you have to try to get your your image of the world your perspective to be as closely aligned to the truth as possible um and Doing that can be easier said than done it, um, throughout a lot of history. Um, I want to read uh, a section of the book that I thought was really interesting and very descriptive of kind of the whole process of, of um, kind of the first step in breaking the chains of mental slavery is to search for the truth. And um, he, uh, he says it pretty well. Um, this is from Areopagitica. Truth indeed came into the world with her divine master, and was a perfect shape most glorious to look upon. But when he ascended, his apostles after him were laid asleep, then straightway arose a wicked race of deceivers, who took truth, hew her lovely form into a thousand pieces, and scattered them to the four winds. From that time ever since, the sad friends of truth, such as durst appear, Imitating the careful search that Osiris made for the mangled body, or that Isis made for the mangled body of Osiris, went up and down gathering limb by limb, still as they could find them. We have not yet found them all. And um, I think that that's a really cool illustration, the idea of, you know, the, the perfect and beautiful image of the truth being scattered. And there's... There's all kinds of imitations and there's all kinds of counterfeit pieces of the truth that we have to that we have to weigh and 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 analyze to see you know what fits and um and also the idea that that we don't have all the pieces and that it's kind of the height of of hubris to assume that you have the entirety of the truth um and that when you hear a new idea you automatically reject it because it's not you haven't you have it's not something you already believe um it's that's that's really a you know kind of uh you know legitimate closed-mindedness um that you are unwilling to think about new ideas and analyze them and 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 decide um whether they are true or not based on you know, a careful study and not just um, bias and and opinions. Um, he um, that so I thought I thought that was a really cool image. Um, he says later on, to be still searching what we know not by what we know, still closing up truth to truth as we find it. This is the golden rule in theology as well as in arithmetic. Um. And again, this is just kind of the same thing. The way the way you judge the truth is, you know, you have what you already know to be true, and then you you analyze new ideas based on that, and you see whether or not they line up. Um, and that's true for for every area of study, not just politics or philosophy, but but everything, even math. Um, that's how that's how we learn, and that's how we we discover more. Um, so, so I think, and I think that's something that is kind of universally accepted amongst libertarians. We tend to be very scholarly, um, very interested in, in studying and, and, and truth seekers as kind of, um, as I think one of the core, um, characteristics of libertarians, especially the ANCAPs, because, I mean, it's not something where you just wake up and you're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. You have to read a lot, <laughs> um, to come to that. To come to that position um and, and you have to be really well read because it's not intuitive it's not um it's not a natural position you have to really understand history and economics and um even some philosophy to be able to kind of reject a lot of the societal values that are common um so i think i think we kind of have that that one um to a certain extent, but I think it's also a good reminder that um, even though, you know, we're kind of on the right path as far as finding the truth, that we haven't found it all. 
um, and and you always have to keep keep seeking truth and, and keep your mind open to new ideas and um, and to changing the structure and that's another thing that I've I've been thinking about lately and my last video um one of you guys I think it was um, Ivan the heathen um, made a comment on my video and said and, and referenced um, the the idea of a new cathedral, and I thought I, I thought that was really cool. I like I like that that image um, to borrow from Milton because I always have had a tendency to think of um, my worldview or my philosophy as as a, a complex structure um, with a lot of pillars. Um, and in order to have a, a good philosophy, all the pillars need to line up. It has to be a solid support. And um, like a cathedral. Um, cathedrals have a lot of, a lot of pillars and um, they're very, the architecture is very complex in order to allow for the high vaulted ceilings and the, um, the tall, narrow windows and all that. Um, and they're also beautiful, which, um, which really struck me because um, because I think um, a true philosophy is beautiful. It's not just um, you know necessary or dry or boring. It, it really is. Um, the truth is beautiful. And um, the idea of a new cathedral captures that. To um, so think about it that way um, is, is really good. I I really like, and, and just to kind of um, make that a little bit more concrete, I really like the Great Gatsby movie. I didn't so much like the book. Um, <laughs> I struggled with it in high school, but I really like this new movie. It's very, it's very vivid. And um, Gatsby has a chapel in his house that that's, looks like a cathedral. It's beautiful, and there's tall windows with the sunlight pouring in, and this gold ceiling, um, and a big staircase on the end, and it and an organ um, with, with beautiful music. Um, and I, I like to think of, of that specifically as, um, as what the truth can look like if it's, if, if everything's in line, if it's, um, if it's structured well. Um, it's kind of like a goal. Um, for for the new cathedral that I'm I'm trying to form in my mind, um, so I thought I thought that was really cool imagery. I, I'm not exactly sure what it's from. I know people online use it. I don't know exactly what that's referencing. I did a quick search trying to figure it out, and um, I don't really know. So I could be taking that totally out of context. But I think it's useful um, for for this discussion as well. Um, so thanks for for bringing that up. Um, and, but the, but the thing with the new cathedral is, I don't think, you can't discount the process of tearing the old one down, um, because it happens and it's painful, and I'm kind of in that, in that right now, and I think, I think everybody is to a certain extent, because you're always having to, to challenge your, your assumptions and, and change, um, aspects of your philosophy, but, uh, but I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really in the middle of that process because not too long ago, I was a conservative um, Republican and I thought, I listened to Rush Limbaugh and I thought that, you know, the Constitution was the best thing ever and um, constitutionally limited republic was the way to go and my favorite um, philosopher was Thomas Jefferson, you know, and um, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like, you know, fairly, fairly reasonable, but it really, it really was a long way to go, um, to read Ayn Rand and, and then, which it was okay, because you still get to have the government with her, but then, you know, to read Rothbard and you're like, and he says, you know, well, the government is, is wrong, why do we need a government? And it really, it really hits you hard if you have, uh, that is, you know, because the government is one of those pillars that I have in my cathedral, um, which, you know, the non-aggression principle is in there too, and they kind of, and they conflict, obviously, on taxation, 
Um, and so you have you have a, a problem in your structure. And um, in Rothbart, I you know I really liked reading his books because um, he points out those those structural flaws that exist um, in a conservative opinion and kind of forces you to shift your perspective and to see that that structure and that philosophy in it from a different perspective and realize and it forced me to realize that his you know his columns his ideas were more lined up with each other there weren't those same um contradictions and inconsistencies in his political philosophy that I had in mine of course I'm kind of stubborn so it took me <laughs> quite a while to um to abandon, you know, the political philosophy that I had, um, to realize that that those those contradictions were not something that I could resolve. So, um, but it's painful. I, I mean, it, but it's a painful process, and that I think that that image breaking idea is um, is powerful because it, it kind of captures the violence of that, and and. Um, how that that's not easy for people to do. And I think it's good for us to keep in mind because we get comfortable to a certain extent with the radical, um, kind of the radical nature of our ideas and forget how, how that hits somebody just kind of out of left field and is really, really kind of shakes, <laughs> shakes their fundamental philosophy and, um, to be patient, um, patient and understanding with, um, with that because I, I mean, I feel like every time I read another chapter or watch a YouTube video, um, I have to change something. I have to, um, not always because sometimes I don't, I don't agree and I keep what I have. I think I have a good, a good structure, but a lot of times I have to because I, I can, once I see, once I see the logic and once I see the structure and how everything, um, works together and, and helps to helps to build that that cathedral better, um, I have to I have to accept it. And I want to um, part of my goal with making YouTube videos is to participate in that. I want to be like them. I want to um, to be able to break the images of of the lies we believe in society. And um, and demonstrate the truth to those who are willing to seek it, and um, to who are willing to change their perspective and look at you know what what the new cathedral could be, um, and analyze that. So, anyways, that's Milton. I think his philosophy is interesting. I think it's applicable today. Um, I think. Areopagitica is valuable to read. It does an excellent job defending freedom of the press, um, and just you know the truth in general, and not being, uh, not being um, kind of closed-minded in a very technical sense. Um, so re really interesting. The book, eh, you know, the introduction's really interesting, where he's talking about the mental slavery and all that. Definitely a Marxist, he's all, cause he's also talking about alienation and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you know Marxism, it's not like you're gonna get converted. You can, you know, you can sort it out um, and and filter those those ideas. Fine. Um, interesting. Um, New cathedral. Let me know if you have any ideas about that, cause I'm not. I'm not, I, I'm still kind of in the beginning stages of, of analyzing that concept. Um, be curious what you think. And, um, yeah, so I think we all should be, we should, we all should be image breakers and not, um, write our own iconoclasties. So, so yeah, um, I think that's it for now. I will talk to you later.